Welcome back, Generals. This is River Crossing playing the Union on Major General Difficulty with JMP Mod version 128.3. My focus in all the battles up to Shiloh is to farm experience so that I can take as many two and one star units as possible into that battle. First, I've put both of my career points into AO now to get it to five. Why? Because my army relies heavily on getting experience for both my officers and my units to accumulate stars. By going to five now, I can take four divisions in the river crossing. I'll just spread the 15 units that I can take across those four divisions. Experience for corps and division commanders is a set amount, and I want to be developing my officers as much as possible to get major generals and then lieutenant generals. The career points that I get from River Crossing and Logan's Crossroads will go into Recon to give me 6 going into Shiloh. Since the weapons used by the AI in the next two battles are nothing really special, I prefer to take AO to 5 now and get that 4th Division officer some experience rather than splitting the two points between AO and Recon. Since we are discussing officers, I said in the Bull Run video that the Academy does not reset like the Armory. You will receive 14 officers after Bull Run, Shiloh, and Gaines's Mill. I don't recall if that trend of 14 continues or not. Just know that the officers are always being added after Grand Battles. The officers added are completely random. In theory, you could get 14 generals or you could get 14 captains, but more than likely you're going to get a few of each rank. Next, I used Brigadier Generals Harland and Brown as 3rd and 4th Division Commanders. I then created my 2nd Corps and 1 Division. I've divided the four battles between Philippi and Shiloh into two groups of two. With the Stress Call on first bull run, I did my best to power 6 units up to 2 stars, 2 units up to 1 star, and then made 2 1 star units. Two of my artillery batteries didn't make it to their second star yet. I will now use River Crossing and Logan's Crossroads to attempt to power up 10 rookie units to one star, while getting Woods and Scales to their second star, and then rotating in my experienced units to get them some more battles lead points and experience. It's probably a good idea to understand how units gain experience in version 128. I know it seems rather basic, but before I jump into explaining how I'm going to get a bunch of rookies to one star in just two battles, uh, it'll be good to quickly review the mechanics that are involved. Originally, unit experience was based on a combination of unit stat gains in the experience level of your officer. With the battle's lead points and 1.28, now you have to consider any penalties or bonuses that affect both the officer and the unit experience levels. For the purposes of this discussion, I'm focused on how each unit stat increases and won't be discussing what each stat does for your performance, with a couple of exceptions. Your command is based on your brigade and division officers and is not driven by the unit itself. Efficiency is gained by killing the enemy. It doesn't matter if it's shooting or melee. Max efficiency is limited to your command level, therefore, whenever possible, you should have more command than efficiency. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to camp for Shiloh. Morale is based on time in battle and has a cap of 10 points per battle, unless you are near an enemy or in combat, and then it can increase further. Stamina is increased by distance traveled by the unit and completing reload cycles. Like morale, it has a cap of 10 points per battle unless you are in combat or near an enemy. The firearm stat increases by completing reload cycles of a weapon and is not based on kills. And obviously the melee stat is increased based on melee kills. So one quick tip. Notice that both firearms and stamina are increased by your reload cycles. Keep that in mind for green units in the early game trying to get that first star. The low quality infantry weapons have fire rates that are 10-25% to faster than most of the common better accuracy weapons like you will use for much of the campaign, such as the 61 Springfields and Lorenzas. 
Light smoothbore artillery have fire rates that are around 27% faster than the medium smoothbores and 40% faster than the 24 pound howitzers. As I said, efficiency is based on getting kills and will be low for rookie units. Kills are affected by accuracy, among other things. The firearm stat is what increases your base accuracy, which is then modified by your weapon and accuracy perks. Therefore, it can be a cost-effective strategy to use cheaper weapons like the 55 Springfields when trying to get a green unit up to their first star because the firearms and stamina stats will increase just by loading the weapon, whether they can actually hit anything or not. Once you get to their first star, you can give them an accuracy perk and then swap them out to a higher accuracy weapon to be able to kill better and help their efficiency stat get moving as you work towards your second star. Now let me be absolutely clear. If you have higher accuracy weapons to give to your rookies, then you should do that. I'm not saying that low quality weapons are better than high quality weapons for shooting. What I'm saying is, at this point in the campaign, Harper's Ferries, Lorenz's, and 61 Springfields aren't exactly overflowing in the armory as low-cost options. So get what you can with reputation points, but don't feel pressured to buy the expensive weapons to level them up to the first star. Rookie units suck because their stats suck and they have no perks, not because of the weapon that they're carrying. The rank and experience level of your brigade officer also contributes to your unit experience and can be significant. With a rookie unit, you may not see more than a 5 to 10 point difference in unit XP between a captain and a lieutenant colonel, but there can be more than a 20 point difference between a lieutenant colonel and a full bird colonel or a general. That makes buying officers to bootstrap rookies up to one star sort of a go big or go home type of thing, and I'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. The next part of the unit XP equation is the battle's lead bonus, which starts out as a penalty. This bonus applies directly to the officer and unit experience bars. It does not affect the individual unit stat progression. Both the officer and unit experience point bars start out with a 15% penalty with zero battles led. That drops to 7.5% penalty with one point and then down to zero with two battles led. There is a decreasing rate of return up to a maximum bonus of 23% at 10 battles led. Probably the biggest wild card contributing to unit experience is plain old opportunities to fight. Two units with the exact same configuration can go into a battle and have very different unit XP gained based on how the battles played out and how much combat they experienced even when they might have been right next to each other. So be careful when trying to draw conclusions based off of comparing results from a very small sample size. For unit stats that are based off from killing, such as efficiency and melee, Larger units will gain those stats faster because they kill more of the enemy. Let's quickly review the units that are in 4th Division before I toss them into 2nd Corps because these 5 units are going to be sitting this battle out. Then I'll talk about the units that are actually going to River Crossing. I'm also going to move Woods and Scales into 4th Division after I move these so 4th Division will deploy. Braxton has 782 total kills between Distress Call and Bull Run. He started with 58 experience, went to 77 after Distress Call. He gained 26 at Bull Run, so he got his first star and has 3 XP towards his second star. As we just discussed, this unit's XP is based off from the unit's stats, Braxton's rank and experience level, and his battle's lead points. I gave Braxton an accuracy perk and have not added any troops. Lepian has 586 total kills. He started with 63 XP as a green unit and went to 82 after distress call. He gained 27 XP at Bull Run to get his first star and is now at 9 XP towards his second star. I'm giving Lepian an accuracy perk and I've not added any troops to him. 
So you've heard of hold my beer. Well, this is a hold my weapon. I gave Leppy and muskets to hold in camp so I can give his 55 Springfields to a new rookie unit. Swapping out weapons to get the best ones in the battle and moving my best officers into the division command slots to deploy to the side battles will be an ongoing strategy that I'll use for quite a while. Martin has 497 kills at Bull Run and lost 43 men. He gained 26 XP, but I gave him 118 rookies to get to 500 men, so his net XP is 8. I also swapped out his carbines for Colt Army six shooters because the carbines are going to a new unit. Walton only had 436 kills because he has the six pounders, and the CSA didn't charge all that much in phase three of Bull Run. He started with 57 XP, jumped to 72 after the stress call, and then gained 29 at Bull Run to get his second star and 1 XP towards the third star. I gave Walton the cover and canister perk. I will be swapping him over to Napoleon's before he goes back in the battle, so I can start boosting his unit efficiency with kills. Loomis has 956 total kills in two battles. He started out with 50 unit XP, jumped to 71 after the stress call, and gained 29 at Bull Run to just cross the line to get the second star. I gave Loomis the Shell Shot perk for the additional damage. Next, I'll review the five veteran units that are going in the river crossing. Wagner has a total of 3,191 total kills over three battles, but he's only led the last two since Scales had this group at Philippi. He started with 60 unit XP and got to 75 at Distress Call, then he gained 25 at Bull Run to get his second star. I added 7 rookies since that's all he could take without losing his perk, and I replaced the Mississippi rifles with Lorenz rifles. The next goal for Wagner and Brewster is to get enough XP, mainly from battle's lead bonuses, so I can get them up to 1500 men just by adding rookies before getting into Shiloh. I gave both Wagner and Brewster the Tier 2 Accuracy perk. You may be wondering why I didn't give him any melee perks. When we get to the next camp for Logan's Crossroads, I will deep dive into how to deal with charges and go over some of the charge of melee game mechanics. In the meantime, the short answer is that charging is often based on calculated risks taken by the player. There are many variables in the game that significantly affect the outcome of melee engagements that are mostly irrelevant for shooting engagements. Therefore, accuracy perks allow you to fight without needing to deal with those variables, especially the ones that are unknown. And again, I'll cover that in the next video in this series. Brewster has 2,750 kills total over three battles. He's led the last two, and Loomis had this unit at Philippi. He started with 58 unit experienced and gained 17 at Distress Call to get to 75. He then got 27 at Bull Run to get his second star. I gave him 23 rookies, which dropped him down to 0 XP towards the third star. I also swapped out his Mississippi rifles for 61 Springfields. Woods is the only unit to remain intact since the beginning. He has 1,244 kills over the three battles, and that gives him a 6% bonus to unit experience and officer experience. Woods had 51 unit experience after Philippi, 64 experience points after Distress Call, and 93 now after Bull Run. I added 5 men to replenish his losses, and that dropped him to 92 XP. He should get his second star at River Crossing without too much problem. Scales has 938 kills over 2 battles. He started with 50 unit XP, went to 70 at Distress Call, and now he's at 98 coming out of Bull Run. I replenished the four men that he lost, so he's now at 97. He could get his second star just from the battle's lead point from River Crossing without ever even firing a shot. My dedicated skirmisher unit was led by Peabody at Bull Run and got 789 kills. This unit was originally made with exactly enough experience to get one star and had 425 men. 
I don't know how this is going to work out, but I wanted to use Peabody on a new rookie unit. So I put Lieutenant Colonel Grimes in here because he can keep the unit at one star, even after I boosted them up to 500 men. I also switched him to Lorenz Rifles. He will deploy to both of the side battles to get him the battle's lead points before Shiloh. Alright, let's talk about my favorite officers in this whole game. The level 88 Fullbird Colonels. These are the colonels that have 88 experience points, so they're only 12 XP away from becoming generals. In the early game, these guys include Brewster, Brooks, Sherman, Keyes, Franklin, Porter, Henselman, and I'm sure there's a few others that I'm missing. McDowell is technically a level 93, but I put him in this group too. Right after Philippi, you can usually get Brooks and Brewster in the academy. And then after Bull Run, many of your allied officers there can show up in the academy or you can buy them worth reputation points. Slocum, Sykes, and others become available after Shiloh. If a colonel is available for hire with rep points, you can pretty much assume it's a level 88 colonel in the Union campaign. So what's so special about the level 88 colonels? Well, any of these guys could get a full green infantry unit to one star just fighting River Crossing and Logan's Crossroads, or any two battles as long as they're fighting. Ideally, you just want them to bleed down and not add any rookies until they get to their star. I've done it with as few as 500 total kills in two battles, because the thing that makes this work the most is just getting the two battles lead points to get them out of the penalty, and that will increase both the officer experience and unit experience a pretty good amount. I used reputation points to get McDowell, Sherman, and the Lorenz rifles. Yes, this gives me a six point morale penalty. But I don't care because no star units completely suck in melee anyway and should be avoiding melee as much as possible unless the enemy is routing or close to it. Brooks has been in the academy since Philippi and then Franklin, Porter, and Henselman came into my academy after Bull Run. All of these are rookie units with no vets. Each unit has 75 experience, except for McDowell, who has 77 since he's level 93. McDowell and Franklin have Mississippi rifles. Sherman has the 55 Springfields, and the other three all have 42 Springfields. Frank is a level 39 colonel with muskets. This unit's going to have to get some kills combined with the battle's lead points in order to try to get its one stars, but I like his chances. Bliss is a rookie carbine cab with 500 men. He is not expected to get his one star until Shiloh, but I want to get him out of the battle's lead penalty before we get into that battle. But he should get to Fulbert Colonel in one of these next two side battles. I only had 86 vets in the pool after Bull Run with average stats of 33 XP, so I used... 75 of them to make McKean's 12-pound howitzer unit with 10 guns. He has 76 unit XP. He's going to need some kills plus the battle's lead bonus, and I'm hoping to get him to one star before Shiloh. Not sure he'll make it. My last one here. In hindsight, I should probably have left Peabody in the skirmisher unit, but I wanted to see how close he could get a green artillery unit to one star in two battles. So this is more of a test to set some expectations for later campaigns. Smooth boars do fine leveling without perks, so if he doesn't make it before Shiloh, then he'll actually he'll make it when we get into Shiloh. So if you've been following along with this series, then you've heard me set goals for each unit to get a certain number of kills at each battle to get their star, but due to all the variables involved, I can't give you a formula to calculate how many kills that you're going to need for your promotion. The numbers that I've been stating are just ballpark figures based off of my experience playing the game. But with that said, as I've demonstrated in the previous two battles and will continue to demonstrate in the next two battles, 
Here are some general guidelines for leveling up units to Shiloh to maximize the number that you can take in with perks. First, any unit in camp after Philippi that has one star with 50 unit XP and is led by a full bird colonel that also has 50 officer XP should get their second star before you get to Shiloh. And I've shown that you can actually do that at Bull Run. Second, any rookie unit led by a level 88 colonel or above should get one star fighting any two battles, as long as you manage their casualties and do not add a bunch of new recruits. Third, adding new recruits after a battle is the fastest way to lose your XP and fail to reach the next star. So try to beef them up when you first create the unit and just let them bleed down until they get that star. With a high level officer, once you get two battles led and the unit gets their star, you will find that you can add quite a few new recruits before they drop below one star. You'll see that in camp before Shiloh when I start adding a bunch of rookies to all these units. Fourth, the battles led bonuses give decreasing returns. So your biggest jumps in XP are going to be at two points when you get out of the penalty and at four points when you're plus 10%. Cumulatively, those first four battles led are going to net a 25% boost in unit and officer XP by going from a 15% penalty to a plus 10% bonus. The remaining six battles led points will get you 13 more bonus points, maxing out at a total of 23. That makes the total cumulative XP gain 38%, going from minus 15 to a plus 23%. I put 20,000 into my supply wagon. Admittedly, fighting river crossing and Logan's Crossroads with 10 rookies isn't a cakewalk, especially when they've got the morale penalty but it's manageable. I got another core deployment for the intel report. So army size has gone down 2,000 men from the bull run casualties. Training has gone up 1% and the army has increased by 3%. Taking a look at the core deployment screen, we see 16,615 soldiers and 36 guns for the CSA and 15,482 and 42 guns for my units. Of course, those numbers are before any splits of the AI units. In 128 of the mod, we begin with control of the Southern VP and the AI has control of the Northern VP. We only have to hold the Southern VP until the end of the battle. There's no need to go try to take the Northern VP. And in fact, every time that I've gone up and taken the Northern VP, I incurred more casualties than it was worth. 10 out of my 15 units are zero star pure rookies, so I want the AI to come down to me and charge me so my young pups can get some experience and get out of here with some minimal damage. I want Scales and Woods to get their second star. Any of the rookie infantry led by 88 colonels should be trying to get about 250 kills here and 250 kills at Logan's Crossroads. I expect a full clear Logan's Crossroads next, so I can probably get away with a few less than 250 here. My infantry are going to be dispersed in a long defensive line. My artillery will be centrally located to focus fire on charges, and my support units will handle the flanks. I will also have at least one detached in the center to spot the AI skirmishers. Wagner and Scales are mainly here to get battles led bonuses so I can add rookies without losing their star, but if something gets out of hand, they can fill holes in the line and fire into the charging units.
Now, sometimes with this setup, the AI can get a little bit passive and I end up having to bait them a little bit to come charging down. One of the nuances about this battle location is that the ground to the right of the VP slopes pretty well, so units can remain hidden from view by the AI until the last moment in most cases. I'll see if I can get the AI cab to attack on this right flank. On the left flank, I am just getting eyes out here to watch for AI units moving into position to attack. I want all of my units to get experience, but sometimes when I'm spread out like this, units miss out. I'm hoping that the AI will also come down to the left side to get some action over there too.
I don't know if I can steal that supply wagon, but I'm at least going to send some units up that way to make the AI think about it. I don't know if I'll be able to keep it, but I tagged it. I'm going to move my right flank forward and try to get more action for my infantry. We're starting to get some fighting on the left flank.
I want Franklin to pull back into cover, but now I have Taylor charging. Since I got the supply wagon, not much is happening on the right. I'm going to pull my cab and dedicated skirmisher down to the left. I need everyone on the left flank supporting with fire on Taylor, and we'll keep backing Franklin up. I have more condition than Taylor, but melee with a no star unit is usually not a good idea. Taylor is wavering, so I'm going to counter charge. Okay, now I'll pull everyone back and try to reform the line. Shifting more units to the left and we'll deal with the cab unit. Alright, the cab unit is wavering, it's time to counter charge. My dedicated skirmisher should rack up some kills here once I can get them into place.
LZ is charging because Franklin is tired, but he's coming right into Brewster with all my flanking units. Franklin's going to route. Brewster will hold here and everyone else can flank to put an end to this charge. McDowell has turned too far, so now he's been flanked and is routing too. So now I need to shift some other units to the left to help out. I'm going to use some of my detached skirmishers to screen off some of these charges while my guys move around or get recovered. Campbell's charging, but Frank is in the fortification and I have multiple artillery to slow him down. I want to keep some detached in front of McDowell to protect him from charges and get Brooks moved into place.
focused fire on Taylor while he comes in. is done. take out these skirmishers and then press forward a bit. It sure doesn't take long for the AI units to go from wavering back to heroic.
Campbell won't last long on this charge. I'll get a new left flank formed up using the woods and the swamp on this side. This map is actually part of Gaines' mill, and this is where our, part of my troops are deployed in that battle. Starting to run out of AI units to fight, and I'm not going to assault the hill, so I'll focus on the skirmishers and LZ.
with Grimes being exhausted, he might not be able to fall back fast enough to avoid the melee. As well as Elsie's morale is holding, he must have at least one melee perk. All right, I lost 458 at 1,189 wounded and 153 missing. I killed about 4,000 AI troops and captured one small unit. Franklin got hit pretty hard going into that charge and Henselman is way behind in kills. Grimes did fine. The artillery did all right. A calf took a big hit in that last engagement. Brewster made it to general, and no officers were killed or injured. So they'll all get their battle's lead bonus, which was the big part of getting through this battle. Woods and Scales both got their second star, so I'll call the battle a success and get ready for Logan's Crossroads. Thank you for watching, Generals, and I'll see you at the next camp.